Hello, in this video we're going to look at an introduction to class hierarchies. We're going to explain the basic principles of class hierarchies and it's good to note that these principles extend to a number of languages. Um, and secondly we're going to explain how these principles are used in the grid world case study. So if you happen to be in one of my classes or if you're preparing for the AP exam um, you're going to be working with the grid world case study and we need to have an understanding of class hierarchies to really appreciate what some of the questions are asking us. Before going on, I want to make a couple points. And the first one is the best way to understand these principles is to experiment. Um, you got to play around. you got to write your own programs. Um, don't be afraid of doing things in an inefficient way and then recognizing that because that's some of the best ways to improve. Secondly, it's really important to focus on vocabulary. So we'll have a couple words in here that are important, but you really want to practice as you're working with people using the correct terminology. And in fact, that's not just in computer science. That's in any language. Um, sorry, in any subject. Um, I say that all the time to students that I teach mathematics to. All right, so let's dive in, shall we? So we have a blank screen here. Um, I want to create a student class. So um, when I create a student class, I'm going to think of a couple things. The first thing is I'm going to think about attributes and behaviors. So that is our fields and our methods. So what are some fields that a student could have? They could have an age, a student number, a name. What are some methods that a student class would have? Well, we're going to have our set and get methods, definitely. But perhaps there's a method for a student to learn, or for a student to sleep, or to eat, or to play. Um, we're probably going to write a two-string method. Now, I don't want to get too caught up in what type of methods and fields a student would have in this case. We're just kind of setting up a template so we can appreciate how to set up the student class within a hierarchy. So, next thing we want to talk about is we want a teacher class as well. And again, we're going to have to think of attributes and behaviors. So we have age, social insurance number, and name as fields. And of course, we have our set methods and our get methods. And then we're going to have maybe a method called teach, sleep, eat, and a two-string method. So if we want to set up a hierarchy for these classes to sit in, we want to think about what's called an is-as statement. We want to be able to complete these two statements. And we have to fill in the same blank in both of them. So we want to be able to say a student is a something. A teacher is a something. So if you think about this, we know that a student is a person and a teacher is a person. So in our class hierarchy, we're going to set up a person as a superclass. That's a class above student and teacher. So we say student and teacher are subclasses of the person class. So now we start thinking about, well, what kind of fields and attributes, sorry, fields and behaviors is a person class going to have? Well, they might have age and name. They might have, again, well, they would have set methods and get methods. And maybe a person sleeps, eats, and has a two-string method. So now this is a setup of a, the start of a hierarchy. And what we think of is we think of student and teacher as subclasses of person. So person is a superclass, student and teacher are a subclass. Now it's important to know this is a small little snapshot of a hierarchy. The Java framework has a huge hierarchy and everything goes up to one class called object. Though we're not going to talk about the object class right now. Lower in the hierarchy is more specific and as we go higher we get to more general objects. So if I was to program this, the next thing I'd ask myself is well, what fields are, are, are the same between the student and the teacher class? And we can see that they both have age and they both have a name. So what would happen is I would remove those from the student and teacher class. I'm also going to look at what methods are, const are the same in the student and teacher class. So we have set age, set name, we have get age and get name. They both have a sleep method, they both have an eat method, and they both have a two string method. So when I actually go and code this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the fields, age and name in the person class and these methods in the person class. Since person is a superclass and student and teacher are subclasses, student and teacher will actually inherit all the fields and all the methods in the person class. So what we're trying to do is to take anything that's common between student and teacher and put it up in the person class. So what would this look like in terms of the code? Well I would write um, public class person, so this would be my person class and they have fields, constructors, and methods. And then I would write my class called student, but at the end I'd put extends person. 
By doing this, what that tells the computer is that all the fields and the methods that person has, I would like student to have as well. I don't have to actually write them in the student class. I write them in the person class, but student would inherit them. I can do the same thing with teacher. Teacher extends person. So that means teacher would inherit all the fields from person and all the methods from the person class. A very important takeaway from this slide here, and it's something that we'll come back to and explore in more detail. Subclasses inherit all fields and methods. And so what that means is that if a, a field or a method is written in a superclass, it gets inherited by the subclass. But very important point here, subclasses do not inherit constructors. So in other words, if person has a constructor, student would not get that instructor. You have to write your own constructors for every class or use the default one. Okay. One last little subtle point here. Just because a field or method is defined in one class, it does not mean it cannot be defined again within the hierarchy. The program is going to look for the most immediate occurrence of that field or method. It looks through the hierarchy from the bottom up, starting at the class you've, been, you've created an instance of. So let's just go back a slide here. So here, notice how the toString is defined in the person class. This is perfectly fine. So if I try and print out a student object or a teacher object, it's going to look in teacher class or the student class, see that there's no toString, and then go up to the person class and then invoke the toString method. But there's no problem in having this. There's no problem in writing the toString in the student class and writing the toString in the teacher class. So if I had an instance of teacher and tried to print out that object, it's going to look in the teacher class first and recognize that the toString student is here, and then it will use that method. Now there's lots of neat things to look at here because you can actually give some instructions to have the computer execute both the teacher's toString and the person's toString, but that's something we'll explore a little later. So now let's talk about grid world and the basic hierarchy. There's a larger hierarchy, but this is your essential hierarchy right now from where you're at. We have an actor, and then the subclasses of actor are rock, flower, and bug. And then we have this box bug class, which is a subclass of bug which is a subclass of actor. And then we have these things called custom bugs, which we design. So what happens is that if we make an instance of custom bug, we're going to invoke the act method of, with the custom bug. What we say is we say that act, oh, pardon me, go through this, sorry. We say that act is an overridden class. Because act appears here in the custom bug and in the bug class, act is considered an overridden class. So if I make an instance of some sort of custom bug and I call, invoke the act method, it's going to invoke this method. So the question we're going to end with is, if we have an instance of box bug, can we invoke the invoke bugs act method? So if we have an instance of box bug here, can I actually call this method? And that's something to think about and something we'll explore as we get into more detailed um, lessons about class hierarchies. So now, let's go do some programming. So there are going to be a couple videos. In the next set of videos we're going to do, we're actually going to design a student, teacher, and person class. And then we're going to do some bug modifications. I hope this video helped.